As an American, I'm used to winning Olympic medals. Lots of medals. Not me personally, all these other much more fit people. Clearly. But some sports have proven vexing in my nation's quest for total athletic domination. Take ski jumping. In ski jumping's entire Olympic history, Americans have won one medal, and it was bronze. And we only got it 50 years later when someone noticed an error in the judge's calculations. So maybe it's my American hubris, but I had to know why. And that why snowballed into a whole lot more. Like, why does the person who goes the furthest not automatically win? How did the technique go from this to this? And how much further can they possibly go while still respecting the laws of physics? Uh, hey, thanks for sitting through that excessively patriotic opener. If you made it, you might as well like and subscribe. Okay, back to the video. Ski jumping was invented in Norway in the early 19th century, which makes complete sense for a country that's mostly snowy hills. The sport was one of the 16 original events at the first Winter Olympics in 1924. Oh, but side note, women weren't allowed to compete at the Olympic level until 2014. You know what? No, I, I don't have time for this. There's a whole documentary on it. You can go watch that. Anyway, back in 1924, this Norwegian man sailed 49 meters to claim the gold, which is less than a fifth of the distance of the current world record. So how did this happen? How did the sport go from this to this? The core of ski jumping is the same. Points are gained or lost for wind conditions, the height of the starting gate, and style. So that's why the skier who goes the furthest doesn't automatically win. But still, the major goal is to go far. And boy, do they go far. Just look at this chart of world records from the early 1800s to 2017. I knew that such drastic improvements couldn't be down to just human evolution, so I phoned a friend. This is Dr. John Goff, a physicist who conveniently wrote a book entitled Gold Medal Physics. Is there any limit to how far people could go on the ski jumping? Are we reaching that limit? There is certainly going to be a limit to what records can be set. It's just we're inching closer because the technology is just so much better than it used to be. Technology and a dash of good old fashioned human daring. But more on that later. First up, all the equipment is designed to maximize aerodynamics on the ramp. I mean, every little aspect of their, their flight suit are made with as little mass as possible. Just look at what jumper Walter Steiner wore in the 1970s compared to the elite jumpers of today. Secondly, the hills. These hills have evolved a lot from their rugged Norwegian origins. Scientific American wrote about the engineering advancements changing ski hills way back in 1932, and they've only gotten more advanced since. These aren't just, let's go put a ramp down any random mountain. They're built on specific curves. So when the skier is coming down, the skis are almost aligned with the the orientation of that slope. This is also how the skier's legs don't shatter upon landing. They're essentially just skiing down a hill, but 10 feet above it, rather than like dropping directly onto a hill. That's right. So these technological advancements helped propel skiers farther and farther and farther. But perhaps the most impactful, and certainly the most visually interesting, is the technique. There are four phases to a jump, and over the years, scientists have published a dizzying array of research aimed at perfecting each phase. So let's jump in. First, skiers build up as much speed as possible on the inrun, or ramp. They set their skis in ice-filled tracks and crouch. They're trying to get as aerodynamically small as they can get. If they do this well, skiers can reach up to around 90 kilometers per hour, or about 56 miles per hour for my fellow Americans. Next is the takeoff. Former competitive ski jumper Karin Bauer told me that that is the most important part. And yes, her name is Karin, not Karen. There are not two Karens in this Zoom call. Really what happens right at the takeoff determines everything that follows it. Jumpers have about 0.3 seconds to generate enough perpendicular velocity to propel themselves up and away from the ramp, while also producing enough forward angular momentum to get in position for flight. It's almost like a spring. They're, they're storing all this energy in this compressed body as they're coming down, and then they're trying to uncompress very quickly at the end to try to help with their launch speed. 
you know, depending on if you're jumping a little bit early or a little bit late, that really plays a big difference in how far you're going to go. And also whether you'll make it to the end in one piece. Finally, it's the part you all came for, flight. You know, once you're in the air, yeah, it's a pretty indescribable feeling. I mean, it does feel like flying. And the goal is to keep that feeling going for as long as possible. This means reversing the goal from the ramp. Now, skiers want to be as non-aerodynamic as possible. They're trying to maximize area. It's essentially like a flying squirrel. I mean, when a squirrel flies, you know, they, they get their arms and legs all spread out as far as possible. They've got the membrane underneath that makes the, the air hit as large of an area as possible. And they can kind of soar like that. Air hits this large surface area and gives the skiers more lift, which is how the sport finally arrived at this. The V. Remember when I said that part of ski jumping's evolution is a little dash of human daring? This is it. Swedish ski jumper Jan Baklov debuted this style in 1985, to general ridicule. But Baklov's technique proved successful. Scientists rushed to study the efficacy of the V and found it to be far superior to the traditional parallel form, even offering 30% more lift if done well. So all of this, the hills, the equipment, the legions of scientists calculating the best technique and the skiers daring enough to try it, is how these jumpers keep going farther and without needing to go so dangerously fast. But that got me thinking, and I think this about literally every elite sport, how much greater can they possibly get? In a physics sense, is there any limit to how far people could go on the ski jumping? Well, the beauty of the laws of physics is they put constraints on what we can do. For the humans that are currently existing on the planet, there is an actual upper limit, but we're just not there yet. That, that, but we're, we're, we're getting to the point where we're only gonna be able to move in very tiny, tiny steps toward these records. And for my fellow Americans, get excited. We might actually get to be part of that action since the COVID-19 pandemic boosted interest in this outdoor sport. A lot of our clubs actually are kind of trying to figure out what their maximum capacity is going to be as far as, you know, continued growth and things like that, which is great. Oh, and if you're nervous about signing your kid up for the sport, Karn assured me that it's actually quite safe. Ski jumping ranks in there with like curling as far as safety in Olympic sports. With the modernization of the sport and I think better awareness around, you know, concussions um, or ligament injuries, there's just a whole nother safety aspect that really didn't exist, you know, a few decades ago. I'm calling it now. The U.S. will win its second ever Olympic medal in ski jumping in 2032. <laughs> I want to gesture with this arm so badly, but I can't. <laughs> it's just flopping around uselessly. Like and subscribe so I can feel better about putting my face on the internet for theoretically 865,000 people to see.